Scientists have divided paleoclimate into two major categories. Greenhouse or hothouse earth. A greenhouse earth has no ice sheets or continental glaciers at all. Temperatures range from 82 degrees Fahrenheit at the tropics to 32 degrees Fahrenheit at the polar regions. For about 70% of Earth's history, it was in a greenhouse state. The remaining 30% of the time, Earth was in an ice house state. An ice house Earth has permanent ice sheets such as Greenland and Antarctica. Temperatures were much colder at the poles and warmer in the tropics. We are currently in an ice house Earth. Let's become familiar with the two most recent eras, the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. The Mesozoic era began 252 million years ago and lasted for 186 million years. This was the age of the reptiles and the age of the conifers, the large trees with cones. There were three periods, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, and many epochs. The land masses were all together in one continent called Pangaea. This was an active period of time for the tectonic plates and Pangaea started to break up and the continents started to move to where they are today. The Cenozoic era or new life began 66 million years ago. It begins with the KPG event or the Chicxulub asteroid that hit near Cancun, which is believed to cause the dinosaur extinction. And this left a large niche for the mammals, and they began exploiting that and evolving quickly. We're gonna spend most of our time in the latter part of the Cenozoic, but let's become familiar with the whole era quickly. There were three periods in the Cenozoic era. The Paleogene was the first, lasting about 43 million years and started about 66 million years ago. There were three epochs in the Paleogene, the first of which was called the Paleocene. The Paleocene lasted 10 million years or so. This is when smaller, placental mammals started to evolve because of the niche left open from the absence of the reptiles and dinosaurs. The Eocene was the next epoch. We're still in a greenhouse earth at this point. Larger mammals and even mammoths are starting to evolve. Temperatures are still uniformly around 30 degrees C but cooling starts to begin mid-Eocene. The Oligocene lasted almost 11 million years, and this is when an ice house Earth begins. The Oligocene began with a marine aquatic extinction event. Grasses were becoming predominant, replacing the conifers in many regions. Even larger mammals continue to evolve as seasonal cooling strengthens. The Neogene was the next period, lasting about 20 and a half million years. The Miocene is the first epoch of the Neogene lasted about 17.7 million years. Grasses are dominating. Seed plants are thriving and evolving. Areas around in Africa are becoming much more arid. 
apes are evolving and the cooling continues. The Pliocene is the second and last epoch of the Neogene and lasted 2.75 million years. This is a time of dramatic climate change. The world has finally taken its modern shape with the continents in their current positions. Hominids, the precursors to Homo sapiens, are starting to evolve in Africa, and the ice house, Earth, continues. The Quaternary period began 2.58 million years ago and has lasted 2.5 million years so far. It is our current period. The first epoch of the Quaternary was the Pleistocene. It lasted about 2.488 million years. This was the ice ages. There were four glacial periods where ice caps came down to 40 degrees north latitude in the mountains. This is the same as Reno, Nevada, Boulder, Colorado, Beijing, China. Homo sapiens were evolving. This is also the time we called Old Stone Age. In the Pleistocene, we see these ice ages or glacial cycles continuing. And they're forming a pattern every 40,000 years or so at the beginning of the Pleistocene and lasting well into the Pleistocene. Somewhere near the end of the Pleistocene, the 40,000 year glacial cycles transition to 100,000 year cycles. This transition was pretty complete by about 800,000 years ago. It is believed that we are in these 100,000 year cycles. The Holocene is our current epoch. It started about 11.7 thousand years ago. This is modern man's epoch. We dominate, we cause mass extinctions all of recorded human history occurs during the Holocene. It's even been proposed recently to change the name from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time now looking at these 100,000 year glacial cycles that we're believed to be in and to try to explain why we are seeing present higher warming trends today. So let's examine the accepted theory causing these climate cycles. The current accepted theory is called the Milankovitch cycles. Our Earth's orbit and orientation effects on paleoclimate. Using temperature data from the last 800,000 years, I've sectioned up the glacial cycles into approximately 100,000 year intervals. Now it's hard to tell what happened previous to this, but it appears things are starting to settle into these cycles around 720,000 years ago. A cycle includes a cold glacial period and a warmer interglacial period. There may be more than one interglacial period in the same glacial cycle. Scientists think 80% of the cycle is in the colder or glacial state. Our current interglacial began 12,000 years ago. There are three main factors in the Milankovitch cycle theory. The first of which is called eccentricity. Eccentricity has to do with the orbit shape and is believed to be in a hundred thousand year cycles. 
A lower eccentricity means a more circular orbit. A higher eccentricity means a more elliptical orbit. Lower eccentricity has a stabilizing effect on the climate since the Earth's distance from the Sun varies less. This means the Earth receives a more consistent amount of solar radiation throughout the year. Higher eccentricity results in reduced solar radiation during certain times of the year. The Earth's orbit is currently in a decreasing eccentricity state, becoming slightly less elliptical. This would indicate that we would be getting a more consistent amount of radiation throughout the year. Two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, affect Earth's orbit the most by their gravitational pulls due to their massive sizes. Obliquity is the second factor in the Milankovitch cycles. Obliquity is the axial tilt and believed to be in 41,000 year cycles. A 22.1 minimum and 24.5 degree maximum. Parts of the Earth have more direct exposure of the sun and its radiation depending on the tilt. The shorter the tilt, the less intense the seasons are. The greater the tilt, the more intense the seasons are. We are in a decreasing phase of obliquity, currently at around 23.43 degrees. The difference between seasons is becoming slightly less. Precession is the third factor in the Milankovitch cycles. Precession is wobble. Wobble affects the Earth's orientation, slowly changing what part of the Earth is exposed more to the sun. It affects contrast between summer and winter in the two hemispheres. Currently, contrasts between summer and winter are less in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. We are moving toward even less seasonal contrasts in the northern hemisphere. Wobble is mostly caused by gravity pulls from the sun and the moon, which cause the earth to bulge at the equator. Our elliptical orbit is in a more climate stability phase, eccentricity, and moving towards stability in a 100,000 year cycles. Precession or wobble is favoring less contrast between seasons in the northern hemisphere. It continues to move in that direction for another three to 5,000 years in 26,000 year cycles. Our axial tilt or obliquity is moderately impacting the intensity of the seasons, decreasing in degree for less intense seasons in 41,000 year cycles. Let's examine the interglacial or warming cycles through the last 800,000 years. We are currently in an interglacial period of the Holocene. My source for this is the interglacials of the last 800,000 years in Reviews of Geophysics, Volume 54, Issue 1, March 2016. The data source for the temperature comes from the Two Degree Institute. Org. Let's locate the interglacial's proposed starting points on the temperature graph. There are 11 proposed interglacials or warming periods 
during the last 800,000 years. They don't fall exactly in 100,000 year increments. You can see that some are a little bit warmer than others, and some have two or more interglacial periods in the same glacial cycle. We can also see that this last interglacial, just prior to ours, is very warm. Let's examine it. It's called the Amenian interglacial. The Amean interglacial lasted about 20,000 years and was the warmest of all of the interglacials in the last 800,000 years. The Milankovitch cycles were somewhat different than our current Holocene interglacial. Earth's orbit around the Sun was more eccentric or elliptical. Earth was closest to the Sun during summers in the Northern Hemisphere. The obliquity, or axial tilt, of the Earth was also greater, leading to increased seasonality. In the Northern Hemisphere, summers were hotter and winters colder. Emean temperatures were one to two degrees higher than current. Sea level was four to six meters higher, probably due to the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. In England, fossil studies show tropical fauna such as hippopotami. The Sahara Desert was constituted by a savanna with transition to steppe vegetation. Then 106,000 years ago, the Emean interglacial cycled to a very cold glacial period with sea levels near negative 133 meters. Temperatures plummeted, ice sheets expanded, Homo sapiens survive and migrate, leading to our current Holocene interglacial. Interglacial one that started 12,000 years ago is our current interglacial. All of the beginning times marked here are approximations by me. Let's look at the last 800,000 years of trends in temperatures, sea levels, and the major greenhouse gases, excluding the fluorinated hydrocarbons. Historic levels and patterns of three of the four main greenhouse gases are described throughout this presentation. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, methane, or CH4, and nitrous oxide, N2O. We will also look at the temperature and sea level changes over the 800,000 year record, and will compare them with corresponding changes in the greenhouse gas levels. All gas temperature and sea level graphs were generated using the tools on the Two Degree Institute website. A few things to note as we proceed. The temperature anomaly was based on this 30 year period. The KA stands for thousand years ago from 2020. The tidal color will closely match color of the parameters on the graph line. The majority of this 800,000 years, 788,300, are at the end of the Pleistocene epoch. With the remaining portion, 11,700 years, are from the Holocene, our current epoch. We'll want to observe general trends with two parameters here, carbon dioxide in blue and temperature in black. Observe how the two parameters correlate throughout the cycles. Peaks in temperatures represent warming trends or again are called interglacial. Low valleys in temperature represent cooling periods term glacials. 
In this presentation, our focus is on interglacial warming periods. Our current interglacial, we should be about halfway through. Notice carbon dioxide and temperatures fluctuate very nicely together, especially when we take out the Holocene. Sure, there are gaps, but the correlation is undeniable. Methane levels the last 800,000 years. Notice again the spike at the end. Let's overlay our temperature data. We still have the Holocene in at the end. We can see that they do correspond. And taking out our Holocene, we can see that they do correspond fairly well with one another. Nitrous oxide levels during the last 800,000 years. Overlaid with their temperature changes, with the Holocene in, and with the Holocene out and the Pleistocene only. Again, we're observing general trends. Here's our sea level changes in the last 800,000 years. Overlaid with their temperature changes, you can see how well they correspond. Notice the delayed effect of temperature changes on sea levels. And if we take out the Holocene data and just look at the Pleistocene data, the graph looks something like this. Let's look at the extremes over the 800,000 years. For temperature, 2.68 degrees was our maximum high over the last 800,000 years. And that occurred in the Emean interglacial that we've already discussed. A two degree limit goal is where much of the current science is focused for our current Holocene. It is also the temperature set by the 2015 Paris Agreement. Carbon dioxide extremes were at 300 parts per million over the last 800,000 years. A limit of 350 parts per million carbon dioxide is where much of the current science is focused. We've already surpassed 400 parts per million. Methane levels hit an extreme at about 800 parts per billion over the last 800,000 years. Present levels exceed 1,800 parts per billion. Nitrous oxide levels hit around 300 parts per billion for our high over the last 800,000 years. Our present level, well over 325 parts per billion. Sea level changes for the last 800,000 years. Observe that the highest occurred around 400,000 years ago, and the lowest occurred right before our current time. Notice that the sea level changes are in meters. The extreme was about 10 meters higher than today's, or 32 feet. We are coming off an extreme low negative 133 meters, which is 436 feet below our current levels. Mm -hmm. 
Now let's examine the current Holocene Epoch. Recall this is modern man's epoch, the Anthropocene Epoch. Human population data will be presented in correlation with the temperature, sea level, and greenhouse gas data. Here's those temperature levels again with the interglacials labeled. Again, we are number one. And remember, 5E was the mean, extremely warm interglacial just prior to ours. This is just the last three interglacials I blew up. So we can kind of see that our current period looks just a little strange, like it was coming down, but now is like fluctuating. Some of that is because of our ability to measure better. Now we look at just the temperature level for the last 17,000 years to get an idea what it looks like. We're coming out of that relatively cold glacial period. Recall that the extreme high was 2.68 degrees over the last 800,000 years, and that the 2 degree C limit is the goal of the 2015 Paris Agreement. Our current levels, just about 1 degree. Our sea levels in the Holocene Epoch, the last 17,000 years, we're recovering from an 800,000 year minimum or low sea level. Recall that 10 meters was the 800,000 year historic maximum in sea levels. And our current sea levels are right around zero. And mainly that's because we've established our baseline during our period. Carbon dioxide levels in the Holocene Epoch. We're recovering from relatively low levels of carbon dioxide from the last glacial period. Recall 300 parts per million was our historic maximum over the last 800,000 years. 280 parts per million was the high during that extremely warm Emean interglacial and a 350 parts per million limit is the current goal in the science community. Current levels, well over 400 parts per million. Methane levels for the Holocene Epoch. We're recovering from 800,000 year intense minimums in methane levels. 800 parts per billion was our historical maximum over the last 800,000 years. 725 parts per billion was the high during the Amean interglacial level. Methane is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide, but shorter lived in the atmosphere. Our current levels, extremely high, well over 1,800 parts per billion. Nitrous oxide levels during the Holocene epoch. We're recovering from relatively low levels of nitrous oxide in the last glacial period. 300 parts per billion was our historic maximum over the last 800,000 years and 280 parts per billion was the high during the Amenian extremely warm interglacial period. Nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide and longer lived in the atmosphere. Current levels, well over 325 parts per billion. Let's zoom in closer and quickly examine the last thousand years data. 
carbon dioxide levels last thousand years. Methane levels last 1,000 years. Nitrous oxide levels last 1,000 years. Temperature changes last 1,000 years. Sea level change last 1,000 years. Notice a change in scale previously in meters, now centimeters. World population began to increase noticeably by 1000 CE. The Roman Empire was successful and prospering. Populations in South America were rising. Central America and Mexico were beginning to develop. China, Asia, and Japan were growing. Europe's population was increasing. North Africa regions prospered and grew. Native cultures in North America were blossoming. Let's take a look at the last 1,000 years of human population growth. All population data was obtained through the interactive map on worldpopulationhistory.org. Notice the y-axis. Global population is in millions. Human population growth rate remained fairly constant until around 1000 AD. By 1700, the population growth rate increases even more dramatically. Until today, we're currently 7.8 billion on the planet. Let's overlay our greenhouse gas temperature and sea level data on the population graph. Carbon dioxide versus human population, 300 parts per million was the max. Around 1911, we crossed the threshold for carbon dioxide max. Methane levels versus human population, 800 parts per billion was the max. Around 1870, we crossed the threshold for methane levels maximums. Nitrous oxide levels, 300 parts per billion was the maximum. Around 1979, we surpassed that limit. Let's take a peek at the last 120 years of composite data. Carbon dioxide levels since 1900. Methane levels since 1900. Nitrous oxide levels since 1900. Temperature change since 1900 and sea level change since 1900. Notice sea level is in centimeters. I ran a Pearson's arc correlation on human population growth and carbon dioxide levels and Pearson R's was 0.99. Did the same thing for methane levels, 0.9815 and for nitrous oxide, 0 0.995. 1.0 is a perfect correlation. Temperature anomaly, 0.95, still super good correlations. Do you think humans are having an impact on greenhouse gas levels? Human population in 2050 is projected to be 9.772 billion. Let's finish by analyzing current data on the greenhouse gases across the globe. Cumulative carbon dioxide emissions from 1751 to 2017 is depicted here. My data source is ourworldanddata.org. United States, the European Union, and China contributed the most over this period of time.
96% of carbon dioxide sources are from natural sources, while 4% are from anthropogenic or human sources. However, we've seen from the previous information that this 4% is having a cumulative effect on the atmospheric CO2 levels today. On this chart, human sources of carbon dioxide are represented. Fossil fuel use represents 87% of all human sources of carbon dioxide, with land use at 9% and industrial use at 4%. This bar chart represents carbon dioxide emissions by country, and I've given here the 2016 top 20 emitters. By far, China was the top emitter, followed by the United States, India, Russia, Japan, and Germany. Here we have graphed the methane sources. 39% are accounted for by natural sources, while 61% are from human sources. 30% of natural methane comes from wetlands, while 5% comes from termites and 4% from the oceans. 37% of methane sources come from energy production, while 25% come from enteric fermentation, which is gases from livestock. And then we have waste processing at 19%, biomass burning at 4%, and agriculture at 15%. Methane emissions by country in the top 20 for 2012. China again was the top emitter, followed by India, Russia, United States, and Brazil. And finally, here's our nitrous oxide sources. 62% are from natural sources, while 38% are generated through human sources. Natural sources are from soils breakdown, 37%, oceans, 22%, and atmospheric reactions, 3%. The greatest source of human nitrous oxide is from agriculture at 67%, followed by fossil fuel and industrial use at 10%, biomass burning at 10%, atmospheric deposition at 9%, human sewage at 3%, and 1% of other. And our final slide in this presentation, nitrous oxide emissions by country, the top 20, 2012. China, again in first place, United States, India, Brazil, and the Central African Republic make up the top five. <laughs>